So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time today uh, to come out and learn about what our new good cause protections entail and how they can change your life or your neighbor's life. And I really am grateful that you have all shown up here because you are also now an educator for the future, telling your neighbors, your friends, your associates, what is now law, which is ways to protect more tenants than have ever been protected in New York State before. I am Assembly Member Emily Gallagher. I am one of the hosts of this meeting, and I'm really looking forward to learning from Met Council on Housing uh, about what is happening with this law and how we can use it to our benefit. Also, looking for more ideas from you all about what's going on in your homes, in your parts of the neighborhood that might need some attention. So please uh, feel free to talk to myself or any of my staff uh, who are here. If my staff members can raise their hand, I've got Jasmine Walker, Miranda Augustine, and Isa Harris here. Uh, and we are all here to help you with every day-to-day -day issue that you have. So um, I would like to thank, before we get started, those who have helped us put this together. As I already mentioned, Met Council on Housing. So uh, I would like to thank um, Communities Resist, who is our um, local nonprofit law um, law firm <laughs> that helps with tenants' rights and housing issues. Uh, we also are partnering with Senator Kristen Gonzalez, Council Member Gen Jennifer Gutierrez, uh, Council Member Lincoln Ressler, who's here, and may grace us with a few words, Southside United HDFC, AKA Los Suris, Make the Road New York, and UNO, United Neighborhood Organization. Uh, and also El Puente, thank you for hosting us in your beautiful space. And um, also um, Maritza Davila, uh, my colleague in the assembly, who's also co-sponsoring the event. Now I'm going to turn it over to one of the bill, original bill authors, <laughs> which this is a little different than the original, um, and my state senator, Julia Salazar. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Emily Gallagher, uh, my partner in government here in Williamsburg. I am Senator Julia Salazar, and um, good cause eviction is deeply personal to me. Um, you know, it's it's personal to me because I am uh, a renter in unregulated housing, um, and always have been my my entire adult life. It is what motivated me to run for office in the first place uh, back in, in 2018. Um, years ago, I experienced firsthand the experience of, of having to go to housing court to demand better from um, an irresponsible landlord um, of our building at the time uh, and had that experience as an unregulated renter, knowing that I did not have the same protections as uh, some of our neighbors do in rent-regulated housing. And I knew that this was unjust and um, it motivated me to organize with other tenants to try to change it. Uh, fast forward a little bit, when, um, when I was elected to the state Senate, uh, the very first new bill that I introduced in 2019 was the good cause eviction bill. Um, Assemblymember Gallagher and I, along with Assemblymember Davila, Senator Gonzalez, all the elected officials who represent uh, North Brooklyn in this area, we introduced a lot of legislation but um, and sponsor and co-sponsor a lot of legislation. Um, but the fact that good cause was the very first bill that I introduced. This is just to say how important this bill um, has been for me over the past five and a half years. Um, and it's because 
until we finally passed a version of this law in the state budget this year, people who live in unregulated housing really had virtually no protections from either eviction, a holdover eviction at the end of their lease, or an outrageously high rent increase. Nothing that you could do about it. People used to call our office. Some of you may have called our office as tenants faced in with these unjust situations. People would call us and say, my landlord is trying to raise my rent by 50%, by 30%, by 100%. These are real situations that many people have had to deal with. And they would call and say, this cannot, this cannot be legal, right? Surely. But unfortunately, until we passed good cause eviction, um, this was legal even, even for the people who this law now applies to. So um, we, we're going to continue to fight. We have a world to win, um, and we want to make sure that every single person in the state has basic protections um, and is able to stay in their home. But in the meantime, you know, we continue to, to fight and we want to educate everyone and make sure that everyone understands their rights under the new good cause eviction law. Um, so thank you again. I know Assemblymember Gallagher thanked um, our many partners uh, who have collaborated um, on this event with us tonight, um, who fought so hard to make sure that this became law in the first place. Um, but I want to give you my sincere thanks as well, because this would not be possible without um, everyone with skin in the game who went on buses up to Albany for years, who um, stood beside me and in front of me fighting to make this possible. Um, and it is because of that work that uh, really over one and a half million people, people across the state, um, who previously did not have protections, now have the security to be able to stay in their homes. So I want to pass it on to our council member, Lincoln Ressler, to say a few words as well. It is always great to be in El at El Puente. So thank you, Marco, and the whole El Puente team for having us. And great to be with so many really amazing tenant organizations. Uh, you know, Emily is my partner in crime in just about everything. We represent many of the same uh, people and neighborhoods, and so we work on everything together. Uh, but I, I really wanted to come tonight to say thank you to Julia Salazar, because she got elected six years ago, and the first thing that she did when she got elected into office was to put forward the most consequential new tenant protection that we have seen in New York City in decades. And for six years, she fought as hard as she possibly could with the support of many amazing tenant organizations that are here um, to make it a reality and to make it happen. You know, there are hundreds of thousands, over 600,000 apartments in New York City that are not rent regulated, that there are no protections. And some of the people who live in those apartments, you know, are barely getting by. And there has not been a single protection in the law to prevent a landlord from doubling, tripling, quadrupling their rent on a dime, on a moment's notice. And it's led to enormous displacement. You know, here in Williamsburg and Greenpoint, we've lost 15,000 Latino residents over the last 15 years. And if more of those apartments had been protected by good cause eviction, then so many more of our neighbors would still be here today. And so... This is a huge, huge, huge victory. It's not exactly every single piece that, that Julia drafted in the original bill, but it's darn close. And there is so much good in it. And we're gonna keep fighting for every piece that didn't make it into the final compromise. Um, and I'm confident with her leadership that we're actually gonna make that happen. So this is a huge thing. It's a huge accomplishment for all of us. Um, that no landlord in New York City can increase the rent on, the, on their apartment as long as it was built before 2009 and the owner owns more than 10 units and a couple other small things. But basically, they can't raise the rent more than 8.8% .8 this year. And 
that's a big deal. And so congratulations to everybody who put work into making this happen, and especially to our senator for her like really extraordinary leadership in helping to achieve the most consequential new protection for tenants that we have uh, we've seen in decades in New York City. So thank you so much. Very quickly, before we get started with the meat of the program, we're still in the snack portion here. Um, Marco, would you like to say anything about El Puente, where we are? Sorry to put you on the spot. Thank you, Assembly Member. So everyone, welcome to El Puente. Um, you know, for over 40 years, El Puente has been really pushing the boundaries of using arts and education as advocacy and really trying to root out what we see as the systemic inequities that exist in this community. And if you go outside this building and you look at the glistening towers right by the water, you see what gentrification has done to us, right? One of the most savage of these inequities. It's not only about our ability to find housing, but it's about our ability to stay in it, to raise our families, to be safe, and to thrive. So when the assembly member and the senator asked for us to host this town hall, we couldn't say yes soon enough, right? So thank you for coming. And I thank this dynamic team for making this happen. And once again, welcome to El Puente. We hope to see you again. Thank you so much. And now we'll turn it over to Dominique from Met Council on Housing. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Dominique Hood. Um, I am a tenant organizer for the Metropolitan Council on Housing. It is great to be here with you all. Um, the Metropolitan Council on Housing is one of the oldest tenant unions in the city. Uh, we started in 1959, and we've been fighting bad landlords ever since. We are a member-led organization, and that means we're run by people just like you. All of our decisions are created by our members in internal democratic processes, and then we go out into the world and we try to organize. So one thing that we mainly do is uh, we run a tenant's right hotline. I always like talking about this first. If you grab one of our uh, flyers, actually, if you want to go hand those out right now, that'd be great. Um, my coworker is going to be coming around giving you a pink slip. Don't worry, it's not one of those pink slips. And um, also a, a quick one pager with everything I'm going to be talking about today in both English and Spanish. But what's also on our uh, on some of our materials, if you grab them at the front, is we have a tenants' rights hotline. This is run by volunteers. Some of them are just tenants that have been through the ringer. Some of them are paralegals. Some of them are lawyers in the housing movement. But they're all there to answer any and all of your questions that you have about being a tenant. So if anything I say today is like, I didn't really get that or what someone else and you can't grab me before I'm out of here, please direct your questions towards our hotline. We would really appreciate it. And if you want to become a volunteer for our hotline, come talk to me after and I'll tell you how to do that. So what we're going to talk about today is a uh, good cause. We're going to talk about the good cause protections that we've been fighting for. I know some of the electeds hinted at it, but we have been fighting for these for a very, very long time. There have been so many rallies, so many marches, so many buses up to Albany. I have heard so many heartbreaking and uplifting stories at the same time from tenants on these buses telling me why it's important that they have to go up to Albany and make sure that this bill gets passed. And we did it, y'all. <laughs> we finally did it. So it's a great moment for tenants all over the city, all over the state. But I wanted to just give a little bit of history. And I was told by a coworker, Dom, don't go history nerd on them. And I promise I won't. But I did want to talk just a little bit about eviction protections in general. New York has always led this country when it comes to tenants' rights. You go back to the 1920s, and there are cartoons of, of landlords holding their head in their hands because New York State's first rent regulations were upheld by the Supreme Court. This has always been the birthplace of these. One of the, um, the main ones that we always talk about is 1969, the rent stabilization law that first got passed. Um, what that did was it gave rent stabilization protections for rent until increases to New York City and the counties around New York City. Um, but what a lot of people were 
upset about it is that it didn't go far enough. And a lot of the things that I've been hearing about the good cause that we passed is the same, is that oh, it didn't go far enough. But something I want all of us to remember is that just a few years after that, in 1974, was when the Emergency Tenant Protection Act was passed, and the fullness of that rent stabilization became a reality. The explosion of organizing that we saw across the state after that pass has led us to where we are today. And that fight is connected. In 2019, when we passed a huge tranche of extra protections, I see some people nodding, maybe they were up there in Albany with us or at some of these marches and rallies. When we passed that in 2019, that was the same bill, the same Emergency Tenant Protection Act that we then expanded to the rest of New York State. So I just want to show that connection between those two things. We are at the beginning. It feels like we're at the end of a fight because we just fought for so long and we won. But we are also at the beginning of a new fight. And that is a fight that we have a whole bunch of new allies to fight with because of these bills. So. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to break it up into basically like three sections. I'm going to talk a little bit about different kinds of housing in New York. And if you're a New Yorker in here, you get to test your abilities, how much do you know. And then we're going to talk a little bit about who's eligible and who fits into the new good cause protections. And then at the end, we're going to get into the juicy bits. We're going to get into what it actually means for you, okay? So that's my, that's my secret plan to get you to stay to the end, all right? Ah, yes. These are many of our good uh, tenant advocates and uh, tenants all over New York City. You could see that we were at all these. This is us in Albany. This is us outside uh, the real estate board in New York. And now here we go to types of housing in New York City. So um, can anyone tell me, uh, so now you see we have these five pillars and one of them is called rent regulated. That's one type of housing. We also have NYCHA. That is another type of housing. We have unregulated, like Ressler was talking about. And then we have subsidized housing, which is a little tricky. And now we have our new one, this final fifth uh, column in the middle called good cause. So can anyone uh, raise their hand and tell me what they think uh, rent regulated apartments mean? What is a rent regulated apartment in New York City? Anyone? 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 Oh, come on. Come on, New Yorkers. I know there's some New Yorkers out there who, who know, I will start calling on people. Hey, I will start calling on people. Who, who knows an, an example of what they think a rent regulated apartment might be in New York City? Yes, sir. That's very good. Absolutely. He said rent stabilized. So rent stabilized apartments are when your rent goes up based upon the rent guidelines board deciding a specific percentage that your landlord is allowed to increase your rent. You are guaranteed a lease renewal as a whole tranche of other protections. That's great. Okay. Now, can anyone... Um, well, NYCHA basically is pretty self-explanatory for most New Yorkers. I think most New Yorkers know uh, about NYCHA. So NYCHA is uh, federally, uh, it's operated by the city, but a lot of its funding comes from the federal government and comes from HUD, and it is public housing. And then over here we have unregulated. So does anyone know what we normally call unregulated apartments in New York City? What do, we, what do most New Yorkers say when they say, oh, I got an apartment, but they mean it's an unregulated apartment? What do they mean? Has anyone ever heard the term market rate? Oh, I got a market rate apartment. Oh man, I'm sorry to hear that, buddy. <laughs> I, hope we, I hope we don't have any problems with your landlord. So a market rate apartment, uh, an unregulated apartment, these are one of the apartments that do not fall under rent control. They do not fall under rent stabilization. They are not a NYCHA facility. They do not have any sort of tax subsidy that would make them opt into rent stabilization. They are just an apartment that someone owns and that they have free will to say they don't want to renew your lease. They do want to renew your lease. They want to jack up your rent. They don't want to jack up your rent, just like our council member was talking about. And then also here we have subsidized housing. I, I, this is sort of like a, an extra credit question, but can anyone give me an example? No electeds, I know you already know. But uh, can anyone give me an example of a subsidized apartment in New York City? Has anyone ever heard the phrase, oh, someone said it, but they don't want to, they're shy, it's okay. Um, but there are certain tax subsidies that landlords and developers can get for their building, either if they're building a new building, um, there's a, something called 421A, I'm sure everyone's heard of, some of the housing folks. 
So um, whether or not you're, there's different tax subsidies. So if you're building a new building, you can get your taxes subsidized if you opt into rent stabilization. And likewise, if you're renovating an older building, there's a different tax subsidy that a uh, landlord can get, which would also opt everyone into rent stabilization for the duration of that tax subsidy. Now, what we find with a lot of these tax subsidies, um, I will refrain from, from uh, you know, editorializing, but what we find a lot is that after the period in which they have to have that stabilized housing, they have to have certain low income housing, a lot of times the rent will get jacked up immediately once that's over. And then we'll see a lot of the gentrification like Russell was talking about. We get to see a lot of what's happening in New York City, all over New York City, where there are plans for the government to create housing that is affordable, and then the moment they don't have to jack up the rent. So we need a solution for this, and that's when where a good cause comes into effect. Ah, we have come to my favorite pie chart. So now this is, uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful representation of where we are in New York City. So um, over here, the big one, which you can see is nearly half, nearly half of all apartments in New York City, which is rent stabilized. So that's some sort of, mostly rent stabilized. Rent control is sort of a, a dying breed, but that all of that will, would be uh, included in this, this tiny little rent control one right there. And rent stabilized basically makes up about half the pie. Uh, another big chunk over here that we we're talking about, NYCHA, 7.3%. That's this huge block right here. And then we have uh, Section 8, a uh, project-based Section 8. And that basically really quick is, um, so you have 30% uh, of your income. If you pay more than 30% of your income to rent, you are what we call rent burdened. That means you are paying way too much of your monthly income out to rent. And what a lot of these vouchers will do is that they will pay the, the difference. You pay 30% and then whatever the difference is between that and the rent, they'll pay for you. And now, over here, we have what that dastardly term I was talking about before, market rate. So now these poor souls have n nearly no protections when it comes to rent hikes or lease renewals. But it used to be, before our diligent elected's hard work and all of your great advocacy and all of us as voters making it happen, this orange used to be all of this. That all of these folks had no, almost no protections when it comes to these things. So now we have this whole new section, which is good cause. About 20% of the entire housing stock in New York City now has new protections when it comes to lease renewals, when it comes to rent hikes, but even more so when it comes to organizing. And that's what we're going to get into a little uh, here's a slide you could take a picture of real quick. It's some of the stuff I was talking about. Um, rent stabilized, what it means to be a rent stabilized building, you have to have six or more units. It has to be built before 1974, that year I was talking about before previously. Uh, and it had to have not been deregulated prior to June 2019. I'll leave that up for a second, let me get a quick pick of it. Also at the bottom, you can uh, get your rent history, but that's on the pink slip we all gave you if you want to check that out. Um, I'm going to go through these because I was sort of talking about them as if you would just like imagine these were going by while I was wonderfully explaining each of them. Um, yes, this is market rate, housing not covered by any regulation. This housing is covered by basic tenants' res protections, of course. Uh, landlords can raise the rent as much as they want or as little. Landlords do not have to give you a reason not to renew the lease as long as they give you the proper notice. And just like um, State Senator Salazar was saying, you do not know how many people I've run into in New York who still think that that must be illegal. You know, they say my rent was, was doubled. This has to be illegal. But before this, for the vast majority of, of, of folks in the city, it was not. Now, um, good cause. So the first main change about good cause is that for those included, good cause, your rental increases have now been legally limited. That means there is a legal limit as to your rent. It's going to be between 5 to 10%. Um, it's based on the consumer price index, um, plus 5% if that's lower than 10%. So the maximum it could be is 10%, but if that equation gets us to lower than that, then that's what, what it's going to be. And they're going to come out with that every year, um, and it's going to be, uh, I believe, in August every year, and you are going to be able to 
see whether or not your rental increase was higher than that because if it is, well, we'll go to that. Um, so you have to have, if there is a, an increase, you are uh, required 30 day notice if you have been under a year, I believe, and then 60 day notice if you've been between one and two years. And then if you've been in your apartment longer than two years, you need 90 days notice. Um, now, it is possible there are still ways in which a good cause landlord can raise your rent above this, but they are going to have to prove it. Now they can't just say, oh, I gotta put in a new boiler, I'm sorry, your rent's going up $1,000. They actually have to prove it to a judge. This is how much I paid, these are the repairs I made, this is what I refurbished in the apartment, this is why I should be able to pay them 12% instead of 8% or whatever it comes out to be. But you have that knowledge, I want everyone in their heart to know that you have the right to know more than a 10% increase unless they have proved it to a judge. So if you get a rent slip, that is higher than that, what, um, what you can do is you can hold the extra and put it into an account, into a safe account, and you can ask that they, um, they bring you to court as a non-payment case, and then they would have to prove um, that they were charging you for that, or charging you correctly. Um, and now the second main change, the second main change is that landlords are going to have to show good cause to evict a tenant they're actually going to have to prove a reason to evict a tenant. And we're gonna go over some of those reasons in a minute. All right, so now we're gonna go over the, uh, who is el eligible for good cause protections? Um, number one is that um, as everyone think of the building that they live in in their mind, think about it for a second and think, is my building a co-op? If your building is a co-op, you, you are not included in good cause. If your building is condos, you're not included in good cause. Um, but if your building was built before 2009, you may be included in good cause. If you rent from a landlord that owns more than 10 units, this is a big one, especially for folks on Staten Island, because a lot of our landlords are smaller landlords. Your landlord has to own more than 10 units in order to apply uh, for good cause to apply to you. And also, you have to pay under what's called the fair, uh, about 200, uh, two and a half times of what's called the fair market rate. So for a studio, that would be $5,846. Sounds wild, right? But I, I specifically know a tenant who's paying that much for a studio right now. I won't say which borough, but we all know it's Manhattan. Okay, so uh, for a one bedroom, that would be $6,005. For a two bedroom, it would be $6,742. For a three bedroom, it would be $8,413. And for a four bedroom, it would be $9,065. So if you pay less than this, if you're in a big building, if your landlord seems to own more than just your building, you are probably now a good cause tenant which means you have protections. And that means that you are allowed to organize as you always have been, but you also have the ability to challenge if they say, I want you gone, or they say, well, they try to hike your rent. Um, one other thing that could, um, I'm supposed to be going through these as I talk, but it's just sort of uh, awkward to come back here. But yes, so we see all the great graphics that we made. Uh, this is, again, what I was talking about. If you want to grab a picture of that, these are sort of the breakdowns based on this year's, this first year. Now, these, all these protections went into effect April 20th. That's right. They're already in effect. But the notices that are going to go out are going to be in August. Starting in August, I believe it's August 20th, uh, your landlord is going to have to put good cause breakdown into every lease, every renewal, every hike, and they're going to tell you why or why not good cause applies to you. Um, so be on the lookout for them. One thing in which, um, I'm gonna try to go to the right slide for this. One way in which all of these things could apply to you but you still don't get good cause protections is if you have your apartment based on some sort of an employee agreement with your landlord. So that means normally if you're a super or a handyman or someone that lives on the property based on an employment agreement, good cause won't apply to you. Um, yes, also if, if it's uh, connected to when the uh, building was built in the future, buildings will be included in the program 30 years after they are built. And this will not affect the buildings joining the scheme until 2039. 
Now, let's talk just a little bit about, so I have these categories, Dom. Like, I know what it means to be good cause or not be good cause, but how do I find out if I'm a good cause tenant? I mean, if I want to find out before they have to tell me on my lease renewal, if they, before I want to find out, what before they have to explain whether or not I fall in the category, what if I want to figure out earlier? What if I want to find out more about my landlord? Well, I want to introduce you to an amazing site it's called whoownswhat.justfix.org. And this is a great site run by a nonprofit. A lot of our uh, people, folks we know in the housing movement are behind it. Um, and basically, it is a giant database of a lot of property records and a lot of the uh, attached HPD records, Department of Building records. It's basically a landing page for everything you could want to know about your landlord and your building. And all it takes is just a quick search bar. It's simple, just like Google. You can e uh, This might be a little hard to see, but you can either do it by the address, so you can put in whatever your address of your apartment is, or you can put in your landlord's actual name. I know a lot of landlords are hidden behind LLCs, um, but if you have the landlord name, that can also help as far as finding their portfolio. And once you do that, it'll take you to a page that looks something like this. So this is the, um, the main bar that'll come up when you look up a building. So we looked up 610 Marlboro Road, Brooklyn, and you see right here it has the year built. So that'll answer your, was it built before 2009 question. How many units? So if this number is above 10, you're golden. You don't even need to look up any of the other buildings that your landlord owns. This is a really great box, which it'll show you an estimate of how many apartments in your building are rent stabilized. And a lot of times what will happen is there'll be a number here, like say there'll be a number 40 here, and then it'll say 38 in red over here. And that means that you're losing stabilized apartments. I think the last time this is calibrated from is 2017. So from 2017 to now, I believe that's what it is. So that's a great box to keep in the back of your mind. Also, evictions executed. I know a lot of New Yorkers find out about their building the old fashioned way by talking to our neighbors. We know when someone got evicted from our building because we were helping them in the hallway or we were talking to them outside. But this is a great way to find out um, just, how much of a, uh, just how much of a bad landlord you have um, is the eviction filings and the evictions executed. Uh, total violations and open violations is going to refer to the HPD uh, data, which isn't right here, but when you go onto the website, it'll be down in this corner. And that was a really great uh, area to basically look up who's complaining, who's complaining about what, how often are they complaining? Was someone complaining about a leak for five months and then they stopped? Does that mean the leak was fixed? Not always. A lot of times people get fed up with 311 and they stop calling. But this is a great place to start if you want to know what your neighbors are going through. If you want to say, hey, I have this problem, but I wonder if my neighbors have it too. This is a great site to start that research. I promise this won't get too nerdy, but we are, <laughs> we are going to go a little bit more into it. So this is good. It's going to kind of look like when you look up a space. So same building. We looked up 610 Marlboro Road, and it showed us a map now. Now we have a map. And now... What this map is going to show, it's going to be a, a map of New York City, and you're going to see a bunch of orange dots at different parts of the city. This is related to your landlord's portfolio. So, and not just this building that they own, but all of the buildings in the city that they own will be listed in the same portfolio right here when you click on this tab, and they'll all come down and populate right below. With this, you'll be able to see not only is my building going through issues with this landlord, but also, hey, wouldn't you know about that? The same issues are in their other building. Maybe we should reach out to that other building. Maybe we should go see if they have a tenant association and have a dual meeting. This page is the beginning of a lot of great work that a lot of tenants have used to get to know each other and come in, in to each other's arms in order to organize for better conditions. Uh, notice, yes, starting August 18th, uh, landlords must provide a notice at lease signing, renewal, renewal leases slash rent changes, and a notice of evictions and petition papers stating why good cause does or does not cover you. If a landlord fails to provide necessary notice, eviction cases might get thrown out in court. So basically how it would work is if you see a rent hike, you should ask for a notice if you didn't get one. And if it is over 10%, you should tell them this is an unreasonable hike. There is a new rent law. 
and this may not be legal, what they're doing. If they continue to insist that this is a good, you know that you're in a good cause building, they are charging you over 10% and they did not prove it and you have no notice of that, then you are within your right to withhold only the remainder of the rent and invoke good cause with the judge in court. This is basically the first steps to trying to use this law for your legal advantage to protect your rights as a tenant. There might be a whole ton of gaslighting that happens this next year of landlords claiming they don't know the new law, claiming that they misread the new law, or trying to twist your arm into thinking that the new law is something that it isn't. And that's why town halls like this are so important, and it's also why it's important that we talk to each other. If your landlord's telling you something in the next 365 days about your rent hikes or lease renewals, and you do not live in a stabilized building, I would talk to all of your neighbors about it immediately. Because there's, even if it is an honest mistake, you are entitled to these protections. It doesn't, it's not about being friends with your landlord or being friendly with your manager. It's about the rights that you have as a New York State citizen. This way, sign down. Okay. So now, just a, a couple of a uh, couple of extra things I wanted to to talk about. Um, so, we were just talking about good cause and the new protections that it gives you in court. Um, our good friends from Communities Resist are gonna come up here in a little bit and talk more about what it means to be a tenant in housing court. It's a big, scary process. I know personally, I spent a lot of my childhood there. It is built to be scary, <laughs> but I want everyone here to know that we are what make it less scary for us. I can't tell you how many times I've been at housing court with a tenant of ours, and we've run into another tenant who has a case later, and they start powwowing and helping connecting each other with resources. Both of them do better because of it. Uh, so these protections are attached to the unit, not attached to the person. So that means that you are protected even if you were denied a lease renewal or you don't have a lease on you currently. These protections are attached to the unit itself. So it doesn't matter the paperwork you have, you have these protections. These protections, I said this before, but these protections are in effect now. August 20th is just when the notices start. And a couple of things I really appreciated that uh, Salazar's office put on their mailer that I just wanted to highlight. These may not be included in the good cost protections, but these are also protections that you have that it's really important to know because a lot of landlords try to pull a fast one on this. And one of them is that late fees. Late fees can be no more than $50 or 5% of your monthly rent, whichever is lower. Also, security deposits. Security deposits are capped at the amount equal to one month's rent. If returned partial or not returned when you move out, then an itemized list of damages slash repair costs is required from the landlord. Tenants can also request an inspection beforehand to determine any fixes that they need to make themselves to ensure that they can recover the full deposit back upon leaving. Um, so with all that being said, uh, we, have a great, we have a great gift that we have, been, that we have won for ourselves and it comes down to this, when you look back at that pie chart, if I can go back to my favorite pie chart really quick before we wrap. Aha, okay. So when you look at that pie chart, when you think about it, when we think about the people who are marching in those marches, the people who showed up early to those rallies, the working moms and abuelas that got on those buses at 5 a.m. to go up to Albany, we're talking mainly about these folks because rent-stabilized New York tenants have had these protections so that they can organize without being retaliated against for years and years and years. We just added a whole bunch, millions and millions of allies to our fight. Now let's go get the rest of it. If you have ever thought about talking to your neighbors about a problem in your building, this is the year. And so with that, thank you all so much. Uh, Met Council, really appreciate El Puente and all the electeds for inviting us here. I'll be hanging around in the back if you want to chew my ear off about anything. And thank you all so much for sitting through our presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Lenny Diaz. I work with Communities Resist. Uh, so I got 
the faster portion of this presentation. It's also really important. It's also really hot, so we will try to get through it as efficiently as possible. Um, just to give you all a little bit of background about myself and about the organization, I've been doing this work since about 2015. I started with the Wall Street Eviction Defense, and now I work with Community Present, which is an organization that's approximately five years old, or about three blocks that way. And we also work mostly with tenants who have affirmative cases, uh, meaning that when you live in a building, in that building, you have issues, and you need to get repairs done. You want to fight because there's harassment going on in the building, or you're not sure about what's going on. We take on that work, and we also help when based on organized day, sometimes the victim cases can and do arise. We help in dealing with those spaces as well. And I'm also not a graphic designer, so my presentation is not going to be anywhere near as good as the last one, but I promise that the information is definitely good and important to have. So generally, what I wanted to talk about is now we have good cause eviction. That means that now there are defenses that people can raise, not that they previously could. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what that actually looks like in practice in terms of when you go to Bowsley Sport, how you actually make these defenses work for you, how you actually make these defenses mean something or part of the jobs. So I have a few slides, I think it's about seven, and basically it just walks through how you present defenses in the first place and a little bit of background that's important for anybody who gets sued in an eviction proceeding to have in order to know which defenses are going to apply to them in the first place. So to begin with, the important thing to know is that in every eviction case, there's going to be a document called an answer. And an answer, you get to put in the defenses that you have. In a not payment case, that can be a number of defenses, including that the rent has already been paid, that they're not recognizing your rent stabilized status, and as a result, there's other issues in that petition. There's also holdover cases where you may also have defenses that are specific to holdovers, for example, that we were being harassed and because we were contacting HTP because we wanted to get the repairs done. And as a result, they need to do something about it and not allow you to get evicted because that landlord is acting in a retaliatory manner. I have two specific examples up here, which are relatively common. And that's why I put it because they apply in both non-payments and holdovers, though the second one applies in a very specific context in holdovers, but it will help because when you're in housing court, no matter what you're being sued for, there's always going to be an issue of money and there's always going to be an issue of how were the papers given to you. So what I have here is just like a brief explanation of Traverse defense, which is a failure to properly serve papers on your person and warranty of habitability, which means that based on the lack of repairs and the notice that was given, to the landlord about those repairs that they should actually discount your rent some amount, either a non-payment or a holdover, based on the fact that the landlord failed to act on it. So again, generally the answer is the place where your defenses go. And we're gonna get into why that's important with good cause eviction. So the other important thing that I wanted to distinguish is actually kind of like something that I touched on already. There's a difference between the two types of cases, that being non-payments and holdovers. The big difference is that in a non-payment, it's almost like a pay and stay kind of situation. So if you get sued in a non-payment and somebody says that you owe $5,000 of rent and you pay those $5,000 before you get to court, that case is over. If you're still in court and there's an issue with the ongoing rent and you get up to date, that case is over. You ha can now stay in that situation. In a holdover, it's a little bit different, and that's where a lot of the good cause protections come in a bit more. The reason why is because in a holdover, the end goal is not the payment of the rent. The end goal is to get you out of that apartment in the first place. And so in those situations, it doesn't really matter if your rent is up to date. It doesn't really matter if you've been a great tenant. It could be somebody that wants to push you out for other reasons. I think living out here, we see gentrification happening. We know that there's a monetary interest in changing the way that the neighborhood looks. And oftentimes, holdovers are one of the tools that's used in order to force people out when there isn't really a good reason to. And again, that's why good cause eviction is so important for everybody. And the reason I make this distinction is because oftentimes in court, I know that when I've represented people, they've told me as much. They've told me I'm up to date on my rent. 
I've never had an issue with my landlord. I don't understand why I'm here. And the first thing we have to distinguish is that there exists a difference between non-payments and holdovers and why even in those situations, these things can still happen, these things being evictions. So here I just have a little bit more information and this starts getting a bit more specific about how to raise your defenses based on the type of case. So the big difference between them when you get the paperwork is that in a non-payment case, you end up without a court date at the beginning. You get a document that tells you that you owe rent. You get a document that says that you need to file an answer, but you don't actually get the, what the court date is going to be. And that matters because that can lead to something called the default. That means that the person doesn't show up to court because they don't realize what it was that they were supposed to be dealing with in the first place. Because they saw the paperwork, they expected to get more. Instead, the next paperwork they get is being told that the case is moving forward without them. So in those situations, when you get a document that indicates that you're being sued for a non-payment, you need to go to housing court as soon as you can. There's a specific time frame, it's 10 business days. But the reason why that's important is because when you go to housing court, you end up with this sort of like checklist um, document that you work with at the clerk's office. And that has a number of defenses on it. And when you're done with it, it also tells you what it is that you're gonna come back to court to defend yourself with and when. So in this situation, in a non-payment situation, you file your answer, you go to court, you do your answer in court, and once you do that, you get your next court date. The other type of case is a holdover case. And in those cases, most people that don't have an attorney in there representing them end up not filing an answer. And we're going to get into ways that you can go avoid that from happening. You can actually provide an answer and give your defenses to the court. But in those situations, when you get the petition, what you actually get is the court date right on it. So again, that distinction, non-payment holdover, keeps being important even as you're trying to figure out what your next step is going to be. So with a non-payment, the first thing you got to do is head to housing court to do your answer in order for you to be able to get your next court date and start defending yourself in court. In a holdover, you get the first court date. And because that happens, that gives you the opportunity to go to court and you don't necessarily have to have that answer be the first thing that happens. But again, if you're in a non-payment, run to court. It's really important that you get to court and file your answer and get your court date and start defending yourself. So the reason I put these up here is kind of like what happened when Don was speaking, that these, this is just important information to have. Because when you're working with housing court and when you're working and you need to actually go to a place, for me, it's intimidating to do something new and to go to a new place if I've never been and especially if I don't have any background information on it. For Queens County, Bronx, all the five boroughs, and within the boroughs, there's also some um, smaller housing courts as well. There is always a clerk's office. At that clerk's office is where you get either the answer for the holdover or where in the non-payment case, you go and do your answer in order to be able to get your next court date. And the reason I put this up here is because if this presentation is provided to y'all afterwards, or if y'all want to take a picture of it, this gives you where the clerk's office is for every borough. And that information will allow you to be able to know exactly where you're going within the housing court to make sure that you're putting in the documents that will provide you with the defenses to your case. So I'm going to leave it up for like a second. So this is going to be super blurry, but Regardless, it's actually the same document that you're going to be dealing with at the clerk's office. So in a non-payment, like I said, you have to go to the clerk's office and they got this sort of like checklist situation. And this is what it looks like. There's going to be a person behind the window that's going to be attending to you. That person is going to ask you, what defenses do you have? And these are some of the defenses that they have readily available. So when you don't get served properly, they are going to check off something for service. When you're saying, Actually, I'm not the person that should be being sued for some reason. They're going to check off this one right here. And with good cause eviction, I don't know if the court has necessarily updated what this looks like yet. And because of that, there's got to be a way to actually present that defense. So in a non-payment case, at the very bottom, there's always an other. And this was actually very see-through when I made the presentation. And it totally covers up the fact that it says other right here. But this says other. And after other, it has the specifics for how you can present a defense. 
in a non-payment case, when we were talking about good cause eviction, it said that you couldn't get an increase of over 8.8% right now in New York. I think we were using the number 10% earlier. Either way, you know that if you see an increase that's 20%, 30%, that it will be improper under good cause eviction. So if you live in an apartment, you know that your landlord owns more than 10 units, then you can go to the housing court and let them know that I am being sued for an increased rent that is greater than that allowed by good cause eviction. That's not the only way to present that information, but I wrote it in here because it's a succinct way of making sure that when you go to the clerk's office and you're dealing with somebody that's dealing with about 50 other people in the past hour and doesn't have any memory of who you are, they will be able to write this in. You can say, I have another defense. I have a defense based on good cause eviction. That defense is that I am being sued for a, an amount of rent that increased too much based on the good cause law. And I need that written into my answer. That will allow you to defend yourself based on good cause eviction in a non-payment case. So this is a very specific example that I'll say based on my own experience, I haven't seen all that much of because it's what a pro se holdover answer looks like. The reason I say we don't see that that often is because usually when people know that they have a court date coming up, like in a holdover case, again, that distinction comes back up, but they know that they have a court date coming up, they'll just show up to court. They'll talk to the court attorney when they're presented with the opposing counsel and the, and the court attorney, obviously, before they go before the judge. And when they do that, they don't necessarily have a document that has their defenses in it the same way they did in a non-payment. Instead, the court attorney is kind of going to take a little bit of inventory of what the person is saying and then maybe try to make an answer out of it, maybe put defenses in it. But every single borough at the clerk's office does have these documents. This is a holdover answer for pro se litigants, meaning that you're not being represented by an attorney. That document there can be utilized in order to raise a defense based on good cause eviction. Now, those defenses are a lot, and I don't think that either of us necessarily got into the nitty gritty of what they can look like, and we got time constraints, unfortunately. But there's a very general way that you can include something here, which is to say that my landlord is subject to good cause eviction and does not have a proper reason to evict me based on the, based on the good cause eviction law. The reason why is because the basic premise is that under good cause eviction, they actually have to have a reason to kick you out of the apartment. Before, they didn't have to do that. They could say, give you a 30, 60, or 90 day notice, which only came about after 2019, and before that, it was even shorter. But they could just say, we want you out. And at the end of that case, you knew that you were gonna be out of that case. But now, with, because good cause eviction exists, we know that there are other defenses that are applicable to people. A reason has to be presented for the evictions to take place as long as good cause applies to your apartment. As a result, you can go to the clerk's office, in, even in a holdover case, you can ask for the pro se form and you can fill it in. I believe that my landlord has not provided the reasons that are necessary under good cause eviction in order to evict me. Both the non-payment and the holdover also have a verification section at the bottom, which is just like a sworn statement, which makes it appropriate for the court but I'm just giving y'all an example of how you can make sure that you are raising good cause eviction as a defense, regardless of the type of case that you're going to be facing. Now, with service of the answer, it gets a little bit complicated, and I have a very specific answer here for holdovers, but I'm also gonna kinda like talk about what I imagine most people are gonna have to deal with and how to present it in housing court. So, generally in a non-payment, once you go to the clerk's office, they do that checklist, they add that to the file. Once that's added to the file, the landlord's attorney gets it, the landlord gets it, and it's usually counted, it's in. That means your defenses are in. So if you went to housing court because you got that non-payment petition, and you said, I am, be I am being sued for an increase that's too high under good cause eviction, then you know that that's already in there, and that's gonna protect you. In a holdover, you are actually supposed to serve it, and service has some specific rules. It has to be someone over 18 that gives this document to the landlord or the landlord's attorney. It's supposed to be someone that is not a party. So if you're the only person being sued and you got a family, friends, 
they can go and serve it if they're not a part of that lawsuit, if they don't live with you, because it's housing court, right? It's people that live in your same apartment that are going to be subject to these things. But in that case, if you got somebody that you can turn to that's not involved in that lawsuit, they can go and give it to the landlord's attorney or to the um, landlord themselves if the landlord is not represented by an attorney. Furthermore, in that situation, you're also going to want to prepare something called an affidavit of service, which is a document that has to be notarized but, and that says the person who is not a party to this case gave this to the landlord's attorney on this date in this way. Most of the time it's personal service that you're going to want to use because it's very specific. You can take a picture of the spot. You can take a picture of the place that you went to. You can take a picture of the person that's receiving it. You can prove that you were there. So you don't just have to rely on this representation. But you can also do it by regular mail according to the court website. Now, in a holdover, and this is, again, that distinction and why it's important, but most of the time, people don't have answers. So if somebody were to show up with a verified answer to their housing court case, first time on, second time on, most of the time the court attorneys are going to take a good look at it and will probably include it. I have the proper information here because this is right. But in practice, if you show up to housing court with a verified answer and a holdover, you're going to be in a better situation than most people are. So again, most of this advice is focused on what happens if you're going about this alone. But nonetheless, you should know that these would be preparations that would put you ahead of most people in a holdover in housing court if you're not represented by an attorney. Now, I got a few little tips and tricks up here. And the reason I have these is kind of just to make sure that at the very, very least, you're able to maximize your time in housing court. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that I want everybody to know that if you get a petition, a notice of petition, that's not an eviction notice. That's not a marshal's notice. That means that you're subject to a court proceeding. It doesn't mean that you're being evicted tomorrow. And I know that it seems like something that is like fairly obvious, but it's really not. We constantly get calls about people that are freaked out because they got something from their landlord and it says that they're, they could be evicted. And they think, I don't know when this is going to happen. I don't know what this is going to look like. Am I getting evicted tomorrow? And the first thing we look to see is what kind of document they're dealing with. And because of that, first things first, if you're being sued, that doesn't mean that you're being evicted the next day. Housing court has procedure. Housing court takes time. That can take a few months usually before anything really moves forward in your case. And you're going to be aware of what's happening because as long as you're an active participant in the housing court process, things won't just happen behind your back. So it's important to stay informed and up to date about what's happening with your case and show up to every court date that you have. And within that system, one of the most important things that we have right now is that every tenant in New York City is entitled to an adjournment on their first court date. In Brooklyn, those adjournments are usually about a month and some change. They can go higher than that, but I'm giving a pretty decent estimate of what it tends to look like. In Queens, they tend to be a little bit longer. They can be a month and a half to two months. Again, just based on experience on this. Nonetheless, if you go to housing court and you don't have an attorney, you need to capitalize on your time because either you're going to want to try to find an attorney and speak to a right to counsel provider, or you're going to try to make this last longer so you can find a solution so that you don't have to face that imminence of eviction. And it's important to make sure that anything that is within the system that can help you, you utilize. And that first adjournment to look for an attorney is going to be crucial in order to maximize the time that this case is going to take, which can help you find a solution to the case or find somebody to help you find a solution to the case. The second thing is that at most court appearances, there's also going to be an opportunity for people to speak to a right to counsel provider. That can be an organization like Legal Aid, Legal Services New York City, uh, NILAG, and also some of the smaller providers like Communities Resist, that's us. Um, and when you do that, when you speak to a right to counsel provider, you may have the opportunity to get representation in your case. The reason that's important is because it can be really difficult to make sure that you're actually providing the information that you need to to the judge in a way that they're going to listen to. The reason why that can be difficult is because there is another person on the other side that looks usually a lot more like the judge and is dressed really nicely and is going to talk over you and say that everything you're saying is a lie and that you need to get out of there as soon as you can. 
because the landlord is suffering incredible damage by your existence. But if you have somebody else that can at least be there to try to turn that into something else and try to present legal arguments, the unfortunate reality is that it can be helpful. And until that changes, it's important to try to find people that will help you fight in order to stay in your apartment for as long as possible, if not permanently, or at least to find solutions to the sol situation that you're dealing with at that point. So again, there will be opportunities to speak with right to counsel providers, and you need to go and speak to them to see if you're eligible for their services and if they can represent you in housing court, because that will make a world of difference in how the case can go. And one last little thing I have up here is that you don't need to settle in a housing court case. And I say that as somebody who knows that most housing court cases settle. Most of the time, judges see their job as forcing you to enter into a stipulation. The opposing counsel sees their job as forcing you to enter into a stipulation. And quite frankly, sometimes it does make sense to enter into a settlement agreement. But that doesn't mean that every opportunity that's presented to you as a settlement actually makes sense. And if you don't believe that you're getting what you are entitled to under the law, you don't have to settle. You can push this case to trial. And that push to trial can allow you to present those defenses that we talked about how you would present them in the first place and can allow you to have an opportunity to make the case last longer. And to be honest, most of the time, until you get to trial, the judges aren't really paying that much attention. But once you're in trial, they're forced to pay attention to what you're saying. They're forced to look at your evidence. All that to say, you don't need to settle in a housing court case, even though it's the norm. If you feel like you're being shortchanged, and I've seen this because I've seen non-payment settlements where the offer is your client can pay or they can leave. That is not a settlement. That is them trying to be lazy and avoid doing more work. That is the judge trying to push you to avoid presenting your defenses. You don't need to do that. You can take a case to trial and you can have an opportunity to actually present your defenses at trial. And that's important because otherwise you may feel like you're just being forced into signing a document and that is just not the case. And beyond that, I just have a little bit of information about our organization. It's not a lot of information. It's our address and our phone number. But I do want you all to note it because we have people on staff that can offer advice. We, again, we work, we try to work with tenant associations more than anything, but we also help with those tenant associations when the eviction defense things occur. We have the opportunity to try and not just work in that state, like I'm trying to avoid an eviction context, but also to try and bring cases against the landlord to make the conditions better in the first place. Um, y la última cosa es que, y quería disculparme del principio, yo no estoy acostumbrado a dar la presentación solamente en inglés. Hoy me la pidieron solamente en inglés, pero para cualquier persona que habla español, también estamos disponibles. Tenemos abogados que hablan el idioma y otros idiomas también. Así que por favor no tengan pena de llamarnos. Y si necesitan esta presentación en cualquier otro idioma, por favor, um, yo me fijé que estaban hablando con Rolando anteriormente. Nosotros trabajamos bastante con Saint Next Alliance. Así que si necesitan la información en español, por favor, déjenos saber también. Y fue un placer proveérselos. Um, so, yeah, that's um, a little bit of Communities Resist, a little bit of Good Cause Eviction and how to deal with that. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we're gonna have a Q and A. Does anyone have any questions? I've lived in a, a rent stabilized apartment for 27 years in Greenpoint, and um, I've never received a form RR22A ever. Am I supposed to receive that, and what can I do about it? I'm gonna hand it over to you guys. Well, I am going to direct you to our hotline for a more sufficient answer. Uh, what I can say is based upon my experience, there's a RA21, um, which is a form to uh, complain about not getting a, a release renewal that also has different sections in it about other things that the landlord was supposed to give you. It didn't. So I can give you that um, on your way out. But I would definitely throw that question to our hotline for a more extensive answer on that. Um, and I know also you can sometimes, and you can correct me, Lino, but... Um Sometimes just writing a, a formal letter to your landlord asking for a form um, works. 
that's what I've done every time I needed something like that. And just having it in writing and that you like either as an email or as like, um, like a, um, a red, yeah, a letter that, um, has the received thing on it. Priority mail. Um, that'll certified mail. There we go. It's like password here. Um, that usually will get them to do it. I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know what that form is off the top of my head, but if you call our hotline, we can actually look into it with a little bit more information because there's a lot of forms and it's probably impossible to remember them all. But most of the time, if there's a reason why you would need it and why it would be helpful to you, we would try to figure that out with you. Uh, basically, the, the form says a uh, notice of increase of rent under reg regulated tenancy where fair rent has been registered and the increase is subject uh, to the phasing uh, provisions of schedule of the Rent Act 1977. I think that's a really specific question that we would need to do more research on to like answer correctly because otherwise I'd kind of be guessing at it and I don't want to give you the wrong advice. So definitely either us or Met Council like give us a call so we can actually look into it. And this seems like a good time to plug that my office has a twice a month tenant clinic with Communities Resist at our office. So that we always, we almost always have some free appointments on those days. Okay, who else has a question and can be broad? Okay, great. Um, I believe my building is under the good cause protection. Um, they gave me a one year lease option that might fall within this 8%, 10% increase, but the two-year option is a lot more. And so does it apply to two-year options, I guess? So if if your landlord gave you, uh, send you a lease renewal with a one-year and a two-year option, it's actually possible. Are you certain that you're not rent regulated, that your building's not rent stabilized? Um, so there are six units that are rent stabilized in my apartment. Mine in particularly supposedly was destabilized prior to 2019. Um, I'm going to look into see if that was its own thing. But according to my what I've looked into, it's not uh, stabilized anymore. But there are others in the building. So um, there's nothing in the law, the good cause eviction law that says that your landlord has to, for example, offer you a two year lease renewal. I would I would say um, I mean, what it does if you're if your unit is covered by good cause eviction, it sounds like it is. And we can find out for certain for you um, then. Um, and you're saying that the the one year lease option that they offered you the rent is less than an eight uh, an eight point eight percent rent increase. It might be like right there, or at like ten percent. I was okay. trying to do the math, but it's like right there. Okay. Yeah. I think it, honestly, it sounds like in this situation, if you, it, it sounds like you are covered by good cause eviction based on your understanding. Um, then they are offering you a rent increase that's too high, and I would actually. Initially, before you you know go and and get a lawyer <laughs> or anything, I would respond to your landlord and say you know I believe that I'm covered by good cause eviction. Um, right now, they you know the notice requirement under the law it applies in August, so they technically don't have to give you notice. You're still, however, the the protections are still in place, right? So I, if it were me, I would respond to my landlord and say, you know, I believe that my unit is covered under the good cause eviction law. That means you can't raise my rent um, on an annual basis by more than this amount, by 8.82%. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not willing to pay this rent increase because it's illegal. And then see, you know, begin that, essentially begin that negotiation with your landlord. If um, I say I, I'm, I don't want to pay this because of this, then do they have the option to revoke the two-year option and just give me a one-year re lease renewal? Sure. I mean, they could do that anyway because, you know, the law doesn't obligate them to offer you a two-year lease renewal. But it sounds like, um, if I understood you correctly, the two-year option wasn't ideal anyway. Like, it was an even higher. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. You're going to hold on to that one. Now, our next question. Um, so, 
I, I looked on that website previously that shows what your land, how many properties they had. And my landlord was a slumlord with over 100 properties. And he defaulted. And I'm currently with a, a court-appointed receiver. And I've been, I've been uh, paying rent to them for the past two years or so. Does that change anything at all with the good protection if you're paying to the receiver? Or? Um, to say uh, officially, I do not know the answer to that question, but that is a great question. Um, my guess is we're going we're gonna to find out a lot over this next year about how the nuts and bolts of this thing really shakes out. Please stay in contact with your community and your electeds because we, we want to know how this wall works out. Yeah. But always feel free. I will plug the hotline one more time. Yeah. Call either of our hotlines with these questions. A lot of them have like paralegals and lawyers. You can also sign up for the clinic and come and take, you know, however, I think it's like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, luxurious. Um, love to have you. And also, if you are in our districts, I would love to know who is the receiver of your building because we can also hold them accountable if they're doing weird things. Because that's like a privilege to be a receiver. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I love all of these sticky housing situations. Not I don't love that people are, are going through them, but they are fun when you achieve a victory. It's interesting. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? Okay, in the back. Buenas tardes. Uh, yo tengo en ese, I have rented your vision. El dueño lo compró hace cuatro owner años. purchased it four years ago. Uh, Nunca nos compuso. He Nunca never siempre nos spoke with us. De, he tried to. Sacar, he said he was going to um, make us leave and that he had purchased this building for to make to, for uh, in an area that is now very nice in Park Slope. And he had a lot of um, dissension with us. And so um, we didn't, you know, we didn't give him mind because, you know, he's the owner. But then one day he was very aggressive. And then the next day I told him, oh, don't mess with my family. So I'm going to take you to court. The next day I went to court and I sued him. They had their, um, what do you call it? They had to, they had some people find out how many violations there were. They discovered that there were more than 15 violations. They, they, they said he had to compose. He had to give 15 days notice. And now we're better. I have the third appointment on the 27th of August. My question is, do you also, because this was something that it was, we just, we just found out, and you know, we he, it's something that I wouldn't have done if he wouldn't have messed with my family. So, do you also um, have people who uh, make, who will sue, um, even through someone that's just like me as as a as a resident? Do you? I can't be able to find anyone who will rec who would represent me, and I don't know what's going to happen when we have this appointment. Um, thankfully, so far I've had a a good judge, and I'm just waiting for what um, you know. I'm I'm kind of just looking to see hopefully what God will bring us. So do you also? Um, take care of those who are landlords of um, who are landlords of private residences or is it just buildings would, would you mind just um, sort of uh, summarizing what that question was again I couldn't hear the whole thing do you uh, represent those that are also just homeowner uh, landlords and not or just buildings Oh, okay. Um, well, we, we only work with legal groups that only work with, with tenants. We never work with uh, landlords, and we don't work with legal groups that also work with landlords. I'm not sure if that um, answers the whole of the question. 
Absolutely. I mean, it sounds like there's a harassment case. I'm, I'm working with a couple tenants right now that are in very deep harassment cases. There's actually an amazing woman in the Bronx. I'm not going to dox her, obviously, but she is currently in a holdover case, a non-payment case, and a harassment case against not only the building manager, but then also a separate harassment case against one of the attorneys who came in harassing her at her home. So you can absolutely open up a harassment case. You don't need your current holdover case or your current non-payment case to be completed. And uh, we have additional information. Lo voy a hacer rapidito en español y después en inglés. Usted está diciendo si alguien la representa y si usted está demandando al propietario dentro de la corte de vivienda, ¿verdad? Sí. Nuestra organización hace eso también. Um, la oficina de um, Salazar y Gallagher también ayuda a conectar gente con eso. Específicamente nosotros sí asistamos con eso. Ahí le puedo dar nuestra tarjeta después de que termine. Um, so her question was if there's anybody that helps specifically with people that bring lawsuits against their landlords as opposed to people who are being, dealing with eviction defense cases. And I was just saying that, yes, that's what our organization does. There's also other organizations that um, the Gallagher and Salas are, um, uh, sorry, offices will be able to connect them with if need be, as well as my counsel. And uh, then I just told her I would get my card afterwards. And I want to recognize we've got UNO here who, who helps people get organized and sue their landlords all the time. And every single one of them has sold their landlord, <laughs> sold, sued their landlord and really uh, held tight and have really been through some amazing cases. Ooh, I'll be almost two years before my apartment cash fire. So I'm be two years, fight with my lender, fight with my lender, fight with my lender, fight with my lender, and I never quit. And she, <laughs> and she sell the building. Right. Yeah, I won. I've been there. So now the new lender, they buy the building, they sell it, to, they, they want everybody out. So I fight, I fight, and then. Everybody take the money, and I still have been in my building because that's my building. I live 34 years in the building. Yeah. So it's my building. So now I have a big problem with him. We fight. And he calls me out, of course, yeah, him. And I said, you the ender on the tennis. So I don't know who want to win, but I'm be here. So I say, I want it out, I want it you out, I want to put you somewhere off, I want to give you another apartment, I want to take this, I want to take it. I say, I want my apartment. The reason is he had that big problem now. He made the building again back, but he cut it in half the my apartment. Oh. So when I go and see, like two weeks, my apartment, the first thing I open the door, I say, what is my apartment? That's not my apartment. So he make it two rooms for bed, twin bed. When I say in my rooms, they had two rooms, and I had two beds in each room, what is my apartment? So now, my lawyer, they said, quiet, shut the four car, okay, we want to fight. So we want to fight. <laughs> we still want to fight and want to fight and we want to stay in there. So they said, okay, you want to come in back on one condition, right? No talking to my another tennis, can you and rent control? That is the condition. The second condition, you don't want to have air condition in your own apartment. So I say, okay, you don't want to have air condition in my apartment? No put air condition. I want to put my own air condition in my windows. And that's it, because I pay my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. So many issues in that. And, and that's, you know, these, these problems are often when you find one problem, there's... 20 other ones because a landlord that's willing to try to charge you the wrong rent is also willing to do a lot of other things. So again, I'm going to plug, come call those hotlines, come to our tenant clinic. Uh, you, you can find out about it online. 
Um, at, or you can go to Senator Salazar's office. Yeah, um, I'll just add, in addition to um, contacting Assemblymember Gallagher's office, going to her office, um, our office, which is in Bushwick, um, if that's more convenient for you, if you don't live in Williamsburg um, or, or whatever, if you can't make it another day, um, our office in Bushwick at 212 Evergreen Avenue is going to have um, a, a legal clinic on August 5th, on Monday, August 5th as well. So um, you can call us outside, you know, on any day, doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be August 5th, um, but we'll be providing those services in person on August 5th. So contact us anytime. And the last thing I wanna say, you mentioned you're in Park Slope. There is a tenants rights group there called Fifth Avenue Committee that works on these issues. There are groups like this in most areas that have a lot of tenants. And if you don't know where to look, you are welcome to contact our offices and we can help connect you regardless of where you live. And we can even connect you to your, um, your representative because it's important that your representative hears that their constituents are being harassed. Because I have to tell you that when we are fighting for it's like good cause eviction, it is often controversial with sometimes other people in Brooklyn, other representatives in Brooklyn. So we need the representatives to know when their constituents are suffering. Because if we don't, if you guys don't tell your representative, then they go to Albany thinking this isn't a problem for their area and they don't work to resolve it. So please make sure you tell your reps too that you're suffering. Thank you everybody. I think this is a really good set of examples of what people are facing. And uh, don't forget, we have our tenant clinics that happen regularly. Communities Resist is here for you. Met Council is here for you. Uh, and a number of other organizations all across the city. So please do any, there's no issue that's too small to ask us. We are paid by your tax dollars to serve you. So we work for you, no matter how small the question is, we're here for it. So thank you very much.